Thank and, you. And I would uh, I would say this, uh, Professor uh, Rosenblum. I know I was thinking on the way over to votes uh, that the gentleman from Georgia asked everyone on the panel his or her political ideation except you. And and I'm not going to ask you your political ideation uh, for this reason. Um, it's of no consequence. Uh, when you work as the sheriff does for a blindfolded woman holding a set of scales, politics doesn't matter. I'm very disappointed uh, that any of my colleagues would have asked. They have the right to do it. I'm not going to ask you um, about that. W what I am going to ask you, and I'm sure you do, I'm sure you share with me an appreciation for members of law enforcement at all levels, but particularly state and local, who find themselves running toward danger so we don't have to, and they have to deal with bad actors so we don't have to, and they have to carry guns and wear bulletproof vests so we don't have to. And I guess if the sheriff, if y'all were to have a moment after this hearing, I, I suppose that, that our sheriff today would tell you the same thing that my sheriffs back home, Sheriff Wright and Sheriff Loftus, would tell you that one of the hardest parts of being a local law enforcement is when you have to sit down with the family members of crime victims. If the victim lives, then you have that conversation with the victim herself or himself. If the victim doesn't, and you find yourself talking to the family members, and invariably, the question always comes back to why was that person out? They were out on bond when they committed the crime. They want to know why was the person out. If the person should have been deported and was not, they want to know why was the person here. So how would you help Sheriff Babview or my sheriffs explain to crime victims when the fact pattern is the person was, wasn't supposed to be here anyway, committed a crime while they were here, served their sentence, and rather than being deported, were put back out into the public to commit another offense. How would you explain that to crime victims? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would not enjoy having those conversations. I'm sure you're right that that's a terrible position to be in. Um, you know, on this whole question of, of the uh, convicted uh, criminals being released, I, I, I find that um, I haven't studied those data like Ms. Vaughn has, but, but I think we all can agree that a plain reading of both the 2010 enforcement priorities and the 2014 enforcement priorities says that people who have been convicted of serious crimes are the executive branch's top enforcement priority. So do you, do you consider domestic violence to be a serious crime? I believe that, that uh, domestic violence crime would be in the top priority category on both the 2010 and 2014. Certainly in 2010 it was. I, I, I mean, I see your counsel shaking her head. I may be wrong about 214. It may be in the second category in 214. Well, I, I, what I found surprising was the comprehensive Senate immigration plan that so many of my colleagues uh, on the other side fell in love with. You, you can actually be convicted of domestic violence and still remain on a path to citizenship. I find that almost impossible to believe. Uh, let me ask you this about, about law enforcement. Who investigates most homicide cases in the United States? I, I'm sure that's state and local police. Who investigates most robbery cases? I'm sure as well. Who investigates most domestic violence cases? State and locals. Who investigates most adult sexual assault cases? I'm sure that's also state and locals. Who investigates most child sexual assault cases? State and locals. Who patrols the interstate even though it is inherently interstate and therefore impacts interstate commerce? Who, who patrols that? That would also be state and locals. Who went door to door after the Boston bombing along with the Bureau and the ATF? Uh, state and locals. Who provides security to the very same colleagues who don't want and don't trust local law enforcement to enforce our immigration laws? Who provides security for them when they're back in their district having their town halls and their public events? Uh, state and locals. So if you trust them to do all of that, why can't you trust them to do immigration cases? I. I think that that's an issue that that's Congress's to decide. I'm asking you, would you support the SAFE Act? which allows state and local law enforcement to assist federal law enforcement in enforcing our immigration laws. You're their witness. I assume they brought you for a reason. 
I would say that um, while I agree with you that state and locals play a role, obviously, in all of those law enforcement functions, that there are certain unique things about immigration policy. Such so, as? Such as that it, it is a transnational issue that has both domestic and international uh, implications. Counterfeiting um, does, too. And, and so in an example like counterfeiting, the federal government sets the parameters for cooperation between the feds and the locals. And so what Congress So you would done, support you would Congress, support state and local working with the feds in immigration. Well, what Congress has done is to create the 287G mechanism where the Well, all we're trying to do is canonize that in the in the SAFE Act. So you would support that. I'll confess that I'm not sure exactly how the SAFE Act would differ from 287G. 287G creates a mechanism where the federal government stipulates certain ways in which states and locals are allowed to cooperate. So that seems to me to be something that the DHS has, for the most part, chosen not to take advantage of because they've judged that it doesn't serve their their interest in, in, in how they want to manage immigration enforcement. Well, I'm almost out of time, and then I'm going to I either go to the gentleman from Texas or Florida or Idaho. Uh, one thing that has vexed me in the time that I've been in Congress, and perhaps you can help me, is this notion of sanctuary cities where you trust localities to not enforce federal law, but yet you don't trust that same locality to actually enforce federal law. Can you help me reconcile why you, how you can support the existence of sanctuary cities, but at the same time not support those very same local law enforcement officers participating in enforcement? I think the way I would answer that is that certain states and localities, counties and cities, have determined that their cooperation with DHS doesn't serve their constituents' interests because it creates a wedge between... What do they do with the supremacy clause? Well, so they have chosen to limit the way they interact and to not honor those voluntary detainer requests because they've... That sounds like nullification to me. Well, and I'm from a state with a little experience in that. That's true. Um, so uh, this is not an area where I've got legal expertise, but 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 I would say that that you know the great majority of localities uh, have have cooperated with ICE detainer requests. I, I I get that, but some have not, and they are heralded as sanctuary cities, like that is some title to be aspired to. And I don't know what your next law review article is going to be. But I would love it if somebody could explain to me why you trust local actors to decide not to enforce federal law, but you don't trust those same local actors to actually enforce federal law. Well, those other jurisdictions are enforcing by that definition. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Radcliffe.